Hello all, good afternoon, welcome, and thank you for joining today's session. My name is Tomas Munkabrusnafod, and I work in the Adobe Customer Success Manager Group. We are focused on helping you, our customers, get as much value as possible from your Adobe solution. Today we're hosting the fourth part of the Adobe Analytics webinar series, Analytics Thursdays, and we will be looking at data science, anomaly detection, contribution analysis, and segment compare. And this live webinar is in a listen-only format, but is very much intended to be interactive. Please type your questions into the chat pod at the side of the screen at any time. And the team will address as many questions as possible during the webinar, as well as save time towards the end of the session for the questions that we don't get to during the webinar. Uh, just to note that this session is being recorded and a link of the recording will be sent out to everyone who registered, along with a link uh, to recordings of previous sessions in the series. We will also have a closing poll at the end to get feedback on the usefulness of this session, as well as uh, any suggestions you may have for future webinars. Our presenter today is the man, the myth, the concept, uh, known as Eric Medisoff, analytics evangelist here at Adobe. Working in the chat pod will be none other than Russell Whitchurch, Adobe analytics consultant, as well as John Bates, uh, group product manager, data science and machine learning. And now, to get things started, let me hand you over to um, Eric. Take it away, Eric. Great. Thanks for that introduction, Thomas. It's uh, great to be here. Happy uh, Thursday, Analytics Thursday. We got some fun stuff lined up for you. Um, what you may notice today is actually the we're going to be a little bit more slide heavy just um, at the beginning because we've got a lot of topics to cover and I want to make sure that we cover them all with, with those slides. And then of course, um, we're going to jump in into the product and into Adobe Analytics. Um, towards the end to make sure that you can get a feel for not only the technology behind the scenes, but also the, um, you know, get, get a feel for how things work if you haven't played around with them before. <clears throat> so, um, in terms of strategy when it comes to Adobe Analytics and um, data science, we've recognized that we've seen an evolution of the modern intelligence team here. And um, that evolution is kind of aligned with a maturity curve. And the maturity curve starts with what you see on your screens here right now, which is it really starts with a descriptive um, set of uh, analytics professionals where just simply the output is a report or a small amount of analysis that focuses on the who, the what, or the why. Um, then as the team gets more complex, the value also increases so that so that our customers are becoming more diagnostic and starting to think about, well, so what? And from there, um, we're seeing that customers are, are focusing a little bit more on complexity and trying to get even more value out of their data to become more predictive in terms of estimating what is actually going to happen. And then from there, becoming cognitive around how, um, what should be done, what should be done first, and 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 prescribing and uh, what will happen actually next and then finally trying to automate a number of these pieces so that again the analysts in the room their level of uh, value can be increased and, um, and and brought even further to the team so with that what we're trying to do is we've identified that there's a common set of challenges um, across all different organizations challenges like the amount of data is increasing, but I don't know how to put my data to work. Or questions like, um, I need a single view of my customer, how do I do that? And this is what we're seeing across every industry, across every vertical, and across all teams, big and small. Some industry trends that we've seen around data science are that for the analyst and for the business leader, there's an increased adoption of data science tools and skills and those analysts and business leaders need to become what has been termed the citizen data scientist. And that citizen data scientist has to have a decreased reliance on specialized data science and IT teams, but needs to be able to handle some of those um, data science functions as well. 
that that traditional data science then has an increased desire to apply their skills to higher value and more strategic projects because now we're arming the analysts and the business leaders to take off some of the lower level data science um, requests off their plate. So, so first of all, some key considerations when we're talking analysts and data scientists, we're we're kind of dividing them up based on the different tools that they're using. On the left, we have the analyst that is more comfortable using Adobe Analytics and the Adobe Experience Cloud, more comfortable using Excel and PowerPoint, um, maybe some experience within HTML, CSS, JavaScript, SQL, maybe some experience working with Tableau. Whereas the data scientist is going to be a little bit more, um, a little bit more technical and a little bit more programming and code heavy if you take a look at Hadoop and Spark and Python and R and some of those different tools that are on the right there. And so these two can kind of work together um, in a mutual relationship that drives analysts and data scientists to, to deepen customer insights. So what we're looking to do at Adobe is transform this concept of a citizen data scientist in order to create a brilliant enterprise. So that's the role of that citizen data scientist to become um, both a business user that is enabled with power tools. We've seen this rise of the citizen data scientist where an analyst armed with um, you know those tools is able to inform marketers and data scientists and, and uh, as we've been talking about they're transforming this new class of user. Here are some different pieces of what that citizen data scientist does. The, as an analyst, the citizen data scientist is, has a strong domain knowledge, knows the right questions, and knows the data. Um, from, from the data scientist perspective, the citizen data scientist is able to challenge assumptions and um, isn't afraid to learn via failure. Um, and uh, then from a business leader perspective, willing to experiment and tell data um, in, in stories. So, so the goal here is to become a more automated and fast uh, uh, world using the different power tools that we are providing. Gartner recently predicted that between 2015 and now 2017 there was a 5x um, rise in, in citizen data scientists. And so with the power of Adobe we're looking to enable everyone to become a little bit of a data scientist. And that's what we're going to be walking through today are the tools that analysts and marketers and business leaders can use to become a piece of that data scientist. Um, and so we're then able to create this brilliant enterprise where there's a query free approach. You're not leveraging SQL or, or R or data lakes. Instead, you're leveraging the drag and drop tools that you're familiar with within analysis workspace. Um, and the Adobe Analytics Cloud. You've got, you're able to achieve, therefore, rapid breakthroughs that are distributed to all and therefore um, have more valuable outcomes in the end. So the different tools that you have at your fingertips when it comes to uh, the Adobe Analytics Cloud are listed here. You've got anomaly detection, contribution analysis, intelligent alerts, and those three make up what we call the virtual analyst suite of tool sets. And then you also have Segment IQ, the segment comparison tool um, that all, all four of those are actually leveraging machine learning and predictive algorithms in order to enable you to answer the un, unanswered questions. So those four items, the anomaly detection, contribution analysis, intelligent alerts, and Segment IQ are going to be the pieces that we'll be walking through today. So the first one that we're going to be focusing on is going to be anomaly detection where you can leverage built-in predictive algorithms to help identify spikes and dips within your data that you didn't even know existed. We're going to be um, lifting up the covers a little bit and talking about how this actually works behind the scenes and also if you're interested arming you with the information you need to dig even further to understand what, um, what the algorithms are that are driving these. So first of all let's define anomaly detection. Anomaly detection um, discovers those spikes and dips within your data by leveraging automated predictive algorithms that analyze every single metric that you trend in analysis workspace. 
That means not only built-in metrics like page views or visits, but also calculated metrics and derived metrics like we talked about during our previous um, webinar. This is done, uh, th this anomaly detection is done by using over 25 unique algorithms to help identify those anomalies, including seasonal growth, seasonal growth and, and cyclical models, as well as holiday alignment. And what that does is it migrates the work that a data scientist would do in days to weeks to seconds to minutes, um, it, really just seconds. Um, where the data scientists would use exponential smoothing and errors and trend and seasonality um, algorithms, and instead this citizen data scientist is just simply using anomaly detection. Finally, you no longer have to use Python R or Hadoop to, to identify these. You can just simply use Adobe Analytics. So let's talk a little bit about how it actually works. And on the left here, the first item that you're going to see is any time you trend any metric within analysis workspace, we're automatically going to be running our anomaly detection algorithms on that tool set or on, on that trend. And so that means it can be a calculated metric, a built-in metric, a segmented metric, etc. And what you'll see is just like in the screenshot there, a little bubble that helps you identify what the, um, the, the fact that there was an anomaly as well as a shaded region that shows where we were predicting that data set to be. The next step is um, if you're not seeing that shaded region, it may just simply be that you need to check the checkbox all the way at the bottom for that visualization shed setting to enable um, anomalies to be shown. Then finally, if you're looking and prefer to use a freeform table rather than a trended graph, we're also identifying anomalies with that um, item in the top right corner that you're seeing in the, in the two uh, circled areas to help identify the fact that there were anomalies there as well. A real world success that we've seen with the travel and hospitality company is that um, th this customer was able to leverage anomaly detection to identify a dip in average booking value that otherwise they wouldn't have noticed. The marketer simply thought that that dip was, um, was due to seasonality when in actuality it was due to a number of web checkout changes that the marketer hadn't been informed of. So just with that simple identification and that simply simple anomaly detection, um, there was a renewed focus on communication and identifying that communication breakdown between marketers and changes to the checkout process. Moving along to contribution analysis, the goal of contribution analysis is to take those anomalies and rapidly identify what actually caused those significant changes within your data. What were the contributing factors? So what is contribution analysis? Like I mentioned, it identifies hidden patterns or contributing factors for statistical anomalies and it can save you countless hours for identifying um, what, those, what those contributing factors were. It leverages powerful machine learning to do this. So instead of every time you see an anomaly or a spike or dip in your data, instead of having to drag in the, the usual geolocation and campaign and um, you know, new versus returning or browser type, all of that is automatically done for you. The difference here between the, what the data scientist would do and the citizen data scientist is you're turning days to weeks worth of work for the data scientist into seconds and minutes for the citizen data scientist. There's all these different algorithms that the data scientists would have to um, deploy. Instead, you're able to just simply use contribution analysis. And the data scientists would use APIs or R, SAS, or Python. Citizen data scientist says, nope, I'm just going to use Adobe Analytics. So what does it look like? So we talked earlier about these anomalies that are detected on the left. So um, if you're using um, Adobe Analytics Premium or the predictive works, uh, workbench add-on within Adobe Analytics, you will see this opportunity to click Analyze within Analysis Workspace. That Analyze button is also um, going to be available both in trended graphs as well as freeform tables. And what you may not have already known is that you can actually run a contribution analysis on any metric within the system even if there wasn't a, um, a, an anomaly which is what I'm showing here in this third screenshot. The next step of contribution analysis is 
to actually just simply hit run contribution analysis. You have the opportunity to exclude dimensions if you like. We're actually excluding a number of dimensions by default. But if there's any dimensions that you feel don't make sense to um, identify what the anomaly is, you can actually just simply drag and drop them. And um, those dimensions will be excluded from our um, analysis. In terms of what you will see, the output of that contribution analysis, on the left you'll see a list of uh, dimensions that are all statistically significant. Every single one of these is uh, worth inspecting, but we've sorted them using a weighted score that we call a contribution score so that you can t start at the top and drill down further to help identify um, what the different items and what the different dimensions were that are driving that anomaly. On the right, you've got segmentation, and these are clustered segments that will help you identify um, different combinations of dimensions and items that, um, that, that are driving this anomaly as well. So those are also worth, worth looking into. And you can one-click save them, rename them, and continue your analysis. Keep in mind that both of these are fully interactive analysis workspace projects and tables. So you can drag and drop, you can add, you can drill down, you can visualize, you can trend any of those different items as well. A real world success that we've seen with the customer is that there was a 200% increase in visits that was identified using anomaly detection and um, contribution analysis was able to identify that a bot or uh, basically a crawler had been uh, coming to this site from a competitor in order to scrape content off their site for reuse. So the output was very simple. There was actually um, the IPs of those bots and crawlers were identified, and then the historical data was, uh, and those IPs were blocked, and then historically that data was removed using virtual report suites and a segment that had been applied to that virtual report suite to remove those, um, those, that, that data set. Next up, we have segment comparison. And segment comparison um, allows for smart segmentation and identifying the differences and overlaps between your segments to help better inform your segmentation strategy. So how do we do that? Well, Segment IQ um, uses automated analysis that uncovers your key characteristics between your audience segments. And then you can rapidly see where there's overlap between those segments, as well as the differences between those two. From a data scientist perspective, this would similarly take days to weeks, whereas for a citizen data scientist within analysis workspace, just segment, segments or seconds to minutes. And there's all sorts of crazy and, um, algorithms that would be leveraged by the data scientist. Instead, we're just simply recommending that segment compare used within analysis workspace. So how does it work? Within analysis workspace, you have the opportunity to switch on over to panels in the left pane and choose segment comparison. You can drag and drop segment comparison into your uh, project and you'll be given the opportunity to just simply drag and drop a segment into, um, the, into the pane. And when you do that, we're automatically going to assume that you want to compare that segment to everyone else within, um, the, within your platform. But you can also replace the everyone else with any other segment too so that you can then see some overlap. Of course, if you're doing um, everyone else, there's not going to be any overlap. It's just simply going to be, um, it's just simply going to be a, uh, a, a separate set of segments. Just like contribution analysis, you have the opportunity to exclude components for our analysis. So if you want to, you can remove dimensions, metrics, or segments from there. Now, once you hit build, we're going to run those segments through um, three different machine learning jobs that focus on um, your metrics, your dimensions, and your segments. Those are going to be your three machine learning jobs to help identify where there's overlap on the left and then on the right where there are differences um, based on those three metrics, dimensions, and segments. Now don't worry, I realize those screenshots are a little bit small unless you're looking at a gigantic screen and we'll be um, actually walking through those very shortly. Again, one, I want you to remember that these are fully interactive 
freeform tables and workspaces so you can continue to dig into these further. A real world success that we saw was that a publisher was using Segment IQ to compare two segments based on gender. The tool automatically identified that female users were more likely to come from Facebook, whereas male users were more likely to use Chrome and have ad blocking software enabled. So um, what the publisher was able to do was reevaluate what their ad targeting strategy was for both of those segments and then increase the amount of revenue based on impressions um, uh, for, for both of those, both of those different segments. And finally, we have intelligent alerts. Now, intelligence alerts, intelligent alerts allow you to stay informed of anomalies within your data at all times. Whether you're still in the office or at a barbecue or heading over to the pub, you'll be informed of any um, anomalies within your data set. So what is an anomaly? It allows you to leverage anomaly detection or manual rules that you've set up to stay informed of your most important metrics. They can be set up to check for anomalies hourly, daily, weekly, or monthly, and inform any number of workspace users, email addresses, or phone numbers about these changes. So the data scientist may not even discover these anomalies um, until the next report that that data scientist is using. So that um, you know maybe at the end of the month or the beginning of the next month or the next quarter, that's the only time that that anomaly is found. Instead, within minutes, the citizen data scientist can be informed of these changes. Those manual checks within the data scientist would need to be done. Instead, alerts are used for the data scientist, for the citizen data scientist. And then the data scientist could use any tool in order to find them. Instead, Adobe Analytics just simply automatically gives you that information. So how does it work? Within Intelligent Alerts um, and Analysis Workspace, you have the ability to just simply right click and click Create Alert from Selection. When you do that, you're going to automatically be uh, you're going to automatically be filled in the metrics and filters based on what you've clicked. But if you want to start from scratch, you also have the opportunity to just simply click Components and New Alert. From there, you give your alert a name, a granularity, a set of recipients, and an, exp and an expiration date. Once you've defined those items, then you've got the fun part. You have to adjust the metrics and the filters that define your alert. So those metrics could be visits, unique visitors, page views. Um, you define a, a filter of US states or region or country as well. Um, keep in mind that you also have the ability to tweak the anomaly um, thresholds as well. So it defaults to 95%, but you can switch to 90 or 99% threshold as well. Going down to 90% means that there's more likely a chance that you will be contacted based on these, this alert. Going up to 99% means that there's a, a less of a chance that you'll be alerted um, and that this alert will trigger. In fact, as you're making these adjustments, you'll, you can see on the right a preview of over the last 30 days how many times this alert would have triggered. Because we noticed our customers were getting alerts and they're getting them so often that they were oftentimes just auto archiving them to a folder that they never even looked at which was completely wasting their t their um, usage of the um, of, of the alert in the first place now um, one thing to keep in mind is that you can adjust those as well so if it's set to zero then you're never getting any alerts so you want to find a happy medium one powerful feature of having the ability to pull in multiple metrics into a single alert is if, for example, there was an increase on visits, page views, and unique visitors here that was all within my threshold of my anomaly, instead of getting three different emails or three different text alerts based on that, that alert, instead I just get one. And so that's the, goal, that's the reasoning for having multiple metrics within your alert. A real world success that we saw within um, a high tech retailer was that they're automatically able to discover a significant spike in revenue. Without that intelligent alert, the retailer wouldn't have discovered the anomaly until the beginning of the next month. And they were able to capitalize on the trend of this new product that was driving an increased revenue. And they saw an additional 17% revenue coming just from those 
um, those new uh, products there. So with that, let's actually switch on over to a screen share so I can walk through all four of these different items for you and you can get a feel for what they actually look like in a product rather than just simply looking at screenshots. So as I share my screen, I want you to think about all the different ways that you can leverage the data. Um, so actually, before I jump into Analysis Workspace, I want to remind you that we have the ability to continue this conversation offline and after, um, after the conversation is ended in the webinar. And the way that you can do that is just simply by clicking this question mark and heading on over to the community. What we've done within the community, first of all, it's a great forum that allows for questions, idea submissions, discussions, um, and, um, and it's a more permanent place than the Q&A pod that we have within the webinar. When you get there, you'll see that right now, right at the top within recent content, there's a thread focused on uh, Analytics Thursday, webinar series, we've got the focus on data science. And so anything that you do here, um, any questions that you ask, will be permanently saved here and you'll get a direct access to the product team as well as me um, to, to answer any questions. And we'll also be posting the video on this so you can go back and, and check in on, on the webinar as well. So please go ahead and head on over to the community um, for, for, more, for further discussion. So once you've clicked on over there afterwards, um, you may actually want to spend some time in Analysis Workspace just like I do all day every day. When you're here in Analysis Workspace, what I've actually done is I've clicked Project Open and focused on my content consumption uh, template. It just happens to be a friendly place that I like to start in. Of course, we've already talked through a number of different visualizations that you can interact with here within um, Flow. You've got your top different pages where you have page views, page velocity, visits, unique visitors, all these different metrics at your fingertips. You can see bucketed time on, time on page, average time spent. You can look the flow to the exit page, as well as the higher level site section flow as well. But what I want to do is I actually have already clicked to trend my product details um, site section, and I have that trended over time. As you can see, I've got page views, visits, unique visitors, entries, exits, all of these trended. And what you'll see for... Um, for my page views is I actually have uh, my anomaly detection running on it as well. And it looks like on July 18th, there was an anomaly for product details that had a 46% increase and that's higher than where we expected that to be. And so you can see when I hover over any piece of that data set, you can see I've got that trended, um, or, or that, that trended prediction that's showing the green shaded area. If I were to hover over the blue area, you can also see here, I've got the shaded region as well. So when I trend over, or, or I click on over to the anomaly for page views for product details, I have the opportunity to click analyze. So when I click analyze, that's that next step of contribution analysis. Before I get there, I also want to share some of the statistical techniques that we're leveraging. Oh, and I'm clicking a little too far for anomaly detection. And this is where we really get um, focused on some of the more granular items that we're using within anomaly detection. Um, and um, it, it can be quite valuable for you to understand if you're curious what those different statistical techniques are. The way that I got to this was just simply by going to analysis workspace within the help section, clicking on down to anomaly detection and contribution analysis, and taking a look at the statistical techniques. In fact, if you have trouble finding it, I just pinned um, to my Twitter uh, handle, and I'll share these over within the, um, within the community thread, the links to um, accessing these different statistical techniques so that you can understand what techniques are being used as well as the different holidays um, that we're aligning um, within our algorithms. So lots of really valuable information here. If you have further questions right now on this, um, we do have John Bates, who, are, who is our group product manager for data science and, and Adobe Analytics, and he may be able to answer any additional questions that you have there in the Q&A pod. So now that I've found an anomaly here, 
what I'd like to do is actually click on analyze to kick up. In fact, did I do that already? I didn't. So I can actually click on analyze here in order to, to uh, head on over to my contribution analysis. And here, as I mentioned, I've got my list of dimensions that are automatically going to be defaulted to be removed from, um, from my contribution analysis. And doing that does really two things. Number one, it will slightly improve the, the speed at which your contribution analysis runs. Um, but the bigger focus for us is that it will help remove any kind of noise from your data set that, you can, that you're not focused on. So um, I'm actually going to just run it so that it has the default here. And within about, I don't know, maybe 15 to 20 seconds, that analysis will complete. It looks like I'm actually running a different one in a different tab. So we're going to actually wait for that previous contribution analysis to finish running. And when that's done, we'll be able to actually see um, the analysis and the contributing factors for that anomaly that we're looking at. Now, while that's running in the background, I also want to pull up the fact that we're pulling in all of these statistical techniques and sharing them within the help section here as well. And so this is, all, again, where we're getting really into some deep statistical uh, pieces and the different techniques that we're using in order to help identify um, or help you understand what the, uh, what the algorithms are that we're using to uh, identify contribution analysis. So once again, it's in the same area within the knowledge base, anomaly detection, then instead of clicking on anomaly detection here, statistical techniques, we have the statistical techniques for contribution analysis. Like I said, immediately following this uh, section, in fact, maybe I'll just hit reply and add them all in right now. Um, and we've got anomaly detection there. We've got contribution analysis here. And we'll have one more, don't you worry, um, to add in there. It looks like we're now done our contribution analysis and we're able to identify what those contributing factors were. First of all, at the top, we've got just a simple summary that we're able to look at that has the different page views um, listed on the left and the trend. And we've just recently added this blue dot to remind you, oh, what was the anomaly that we were inspecting? So it's a little easier to identify. Now, as you scroll down, you're going to see all the different top items that were contributing um, to this particular anomaly. And so we can see we've got countries as U.S. in the Bay Area, San Francisco, Oakland, and San Jose. We have the, we're also noticing that the time spent is bucketed between 30 to 59 seconds. So it's not really a, it, it's a somewhat high level, a, a, a decent amount of time spent on those page views. Keep in mind that we do even have more than just those initial 10 rows that are showing. We can see the home page, um, 10 to 30 minutes in, in terms of the time spent per visit, and um, the delivery tools that they're coming from Adobe Campaign, from a social platform of email, etc. So lots of really valuable information. As I mentioned earlier, this is sorted um, based on our weighted contribution score. So it's worth starting at the beginning and then drilling down, but every single one of these dimensional items is statistically significant and worth inspecting. Now, of course, you can right click and drill down and interact and visualize and trend any of these different items over time. So we can see page views and unique visitors focused on site section of product details and um, unique visitors uh, for that day on July 18th. Um, we can also right click and create a segment if we need to. Um, we could even run it in segment comparison if we needed to or create an alert, which is a little further downstream for our webinar. Next up, we've got the segments um, that are different clusters of those dimensional items as well. And those dimensional items um, are going to essentially group each of these um, uh, different items together where we're identifying clusters of users that are driving um, that, that anomaly. So for example, here I can see it's a combination of California, US, bucketed time spent on page 30 to 59 seconds. If I needed to, I could actually edit that segment and I could choose to give it a friendly name and save it. So I could say maybe this is our Bay Area um, high time spent on the 
let's see, 18th of July, uh, 2017, page view anomaly. It's a very concise segment name there that I'm using. Um, I can also choose to make that segment public so other um, users are able to, to leverage it. I can, of course, tweak it so it's not just the visitor or the visitor, um, et cetera. Lots, lots of different capabilities. And I can choose to save it as there. And now I've got it listed as a segment for further analysis if I'd like. So any of those are going to be available for me to dig into further. Of course, like I mentioned earlier, these are fully interactive um, uh, tables here. So if I need to drill in further and see what different pages were coming from that marketing channel, I can do that. If I need to see what the different segments are as well, I can also see, well, what was my mobile device type for this particular segment? And I've got that information right at my fingertips. So now that we've gone through contribution analysis and we've gone through um, anomaly detection, let's actually, let's go to the final step of the virtual analyst and, and create an alert so that we're informed the next time there happens to be um, some information that we want to stay on top of uh, or an anomaly. And so we can do that just simply by clicking create alert from this selection or I could head on over to co components and new alert in order to start from scratch. I'm going to actually select marketing channel equals email and entry page equals home so that when I right click there and choose a create alert from selection both of those are going to be identified as my filters. Now keep in mind um, I actually have a lot of capabilities for when these different rules are set. It looks like it pulled in two different rule sets so I can actually remove that one and focus just simply on page views where there's an anomaly of 95% it looks like over the last 30 days that would have triggered three times and same thing with unique visitors where the anomaly exceeds 95 percent and there were three times now if I increase those both to 99 percent then I would expect that that alert amount would actually go down and it looks like there were some pretty significant unique visitors where even with that 99 percent threshold I still would have been alerted three times and that maybe is a good thing because there were three significant anomalies for me to be identified on or, or informed on. I've also got the built-in filters that I dragged in where I can say that my site section equals product details. If I wanted to, I could also say, you know what, I also want to focus in on a mobile device type equaling tablet. And when I do that, you'll see automatically our preview is going to update and uh, based on this additional filter and I can see it looks like about maybe 15 or 16 days ago I would have been alerted one time for these different metrics with these filters applied so you know maybe that's that's the exact kind of uh, this exact level that I'm looking for so I can create my alert this is going to be tablet um, this is quite an alert actually so tablet uh, we'll just call it home entries um, with, uh, and we'll just call it tablet home entries alert. Where it's looking every day, I can, it's automatically going to identify that it should alert me, but I can also share that over to anyone else. There's my buddy John Bates, I can send it to him, or if I want to, I can even add um, my cell phone number, 212-867-5309, and that way I get a text message um, the next time there happens to be an alert as well. I can set an expiration date, which can be useful for maybe short-term alerts as well. We've seen customers use this for a campaign-related alert so that you can, you know, you can have it automatically expire once that campaign is over. So all of this is really the, the um, items when it comes to alerts. One thing that may be of value is uh, taking advantage of these more manual rules where you can see, you know what, if it if uh, page views is below or equals, and I can maybe delete this and remove site section. Um, actually, you know what, uh, maybe just remove all of those different items, and I can say if page views is below 100 for a day, then that's a major problem that I need to be informed about. And those are the type of alerts where it really makes sense maybe to put in your, your mobile phone number there um, so that you know faster than anyone else that there's a major issue going on on your site. 
So page views going below zero, or maybe we pull in revenue as well, and we can say revenue is below, I don't know, 100 uh, euros, for example. Um, if either of those things happen, I really need to be informed quickly because I know that there's a problem on my site. So those are some really good use cases for um, using these other rules um, that are not anomaly detection powered. So we've talked through anomaly detection, we've talked through contribution analysis and intelligent alerts. Let's walk through the final piece of data science that we're um, enabling our customers with within analysis workspace. And that is segment comparison. Now segment comparison is accessible by clicking on your left pane here and seeing panels. And then you'll see a segment comparison panel that you can just simply drag and drop into your project. And when you do that, you're going to see some, some very simple um, settings. First of all, you have the opportunity to show or, or uh, hide your advanced settings. And this is going to look familiar to you. This is exactly the same concept of those advanced settings that we're looking at here in contribution analysis where you can drag in additional dimensions, metrics, or segments that you don't want to be analyzed within your segment comparison. I don't need to do that today, so I'm just going to simply drag in my device type equals tablet and automatically we're going to identify what the, um, the, the inverse of that segment is, where we're looking at everyone else, where we're not, we're saying exclude where the mobile device type equals tablet. If I wanted to, I could also drag in uh, country um, is United States instead of using everyone else. And this way, I know that there will actually be some overlap between the two. When I hit build, that's where we're kicking off those three machine learning jobs that I was talking about earlier. The machine learning jobs are focusing on number one, it's focusing on all of your metrics, Number two, it's focusing on your dimensions. And number three, it's focusing on your segments. And then trying to identify where there's some differentiation between the two segments that I dropped in there. Now that's already completed, but I also wanted to share over the fact that we're giving you the um, statistical test tests that are leveraged within segment comparison as well. And just like before, I'm gonna drag and drop those, um, or copy and paste those, into the uh, community form here in case you need to need to uh, look at those within the thread. So I'm just gonna add that reply there and we've got that information now added into the thread. So let's dig in to what we're looking at here within segment comparison. So first of all, um, at the top, you can see your size and overlap. This is actually quite interesting. It looks like 100% of my tablet visitors are actually also in my, um, in my United States uh, country-based uh, segment. That can be quite valuable and something that I may not have already known um, within my data set. And this is where we're just simply giving you that summary of total number of tablets, total number of US, and then the overlap. Not surprisingly, the overlap matches exactly with our tablet here. Keep in mind, if I had not pulled in that second uh, segment of country equals United States, it would have said everyone else and there wouldn't have been any overlap at all between the two. Remember that this is a Venn diagram that's interactive, so if I right click on that overlap, I can even create a segment based on that selection that says mobile device type equals tablet and countries equals United States. So just a quick reminder on, on our visualization session from a couple months ago. So as we dig in, we're going to start taking a look at the very first machine learning job that we're looking at, where we have metrics that are different, uh, that are statistically significant and differentiate between tablets and countries. Now, there may be 100% um, overlap between those two, but there are still some differences between the two sets. Now, if I take a look, here's a really big one. Revenue is much higher for device tablet than it is for all of the rest of the United States population. And in fact, if I click that, you can see we've live linked that to the, to, um, the trended uh, graph over here on the right, so that you can see the differentiation for tablets versus all of the US. Now, just like contribution analysis, we've applied a weighted score 
to these metrics. So it's at the top, you've got your um, mo your metrics that are most worth investigating, but every single one is worth investigating because they're all statistically significant. The next set that you have are your top dimensions. Your top dimensions are not surprisingly going to be focused on mobile, and um, this could be an opportunity for me um, to exclude some of these mobile focused dimensions so that that noise isn't pulled in um, to, to my data set and my analysis. And if I wanted to, so let's see, here's mobile device type equals tablet. That's not a big surprise at all, but that's 100% of my device type tablet uh, segment. And if I needed to, I could click my gear and say, you know what, I oh, maybe I click my gear and say show advanced settings, and I can drag on in that mobile device type so that if I were to click build here again, then that wouldn't be included within my dimension. As well as cookie support or audio support, those are not really all that interesting for me to look at. But it's not surprising that our machine learning jobs discovered that differentiation between the two. Now some other interesting things to dig into here is we have, for example, campaign first touch channel equals, uh, equals, uh, why is that not shown? We've got, maybe just open it up a little more, Eric. Equals you know, unknown. Well, that's not super interesting. Let's find one that is. All of these are unknown. And last touch equals, last touch channel equals direct. So it looks like tablets are not really coming from direct, whereas country United States is. So that could be worth investigating. A little further let me shrink this back down so we can see them together you can see the the vast differentiation between your last touch channel direct and um, uh, for tablets versus United States so certainly worth digging into and under and learning more about that and instead of uh, for tablet you could see well what are the channels that are driving those those high revenue um, customers then finally we've got our top segments against your segments. And so this is where it's gonna take a look at all the different segments that you've created and have been shared on over to you to identify the differentiate, differentiation between them. And the first one is, it looks like tablet visitors have a really high return visit rate, whereas, you know what, overall your, your US um, customers, not so much. Much big difference there. Something else that could be of interest is uh, take a look at that. Here's that segment that we just created a second ago with my crazy page view anomaly. It looks like there's a big differentiation there too where, you know, we didn't discover this earlier, but a high amount of device types equals tablet is actually driving um, that, that, uh, that, that segment. So really interesting information that we're able to gather just within a few clicks without any SQL, without any understanding of those statistical techniques used behind the scenes. Really powerful, and like I mentioned, this again are all fully interactive, uh, freeform tables that are available uh, for you to use. So with that, we've got about eight minutes left. Um, I'm gonna pause the screen share here and take a look at our uh, question and answer pod and see if there's anything that we haven't been able to answer. Um, I know we've got some very, very smart folks um, that are handling the uh, the Q&A pods, so most likely we don't have any unanswered questions. Um, great, and it, I'm not actually seeing any that um, are actually, John, There, I think there's one, John, that I may want to assign on over to you for, for an answer, and then we should be good to go there. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to hand it back on over to Thomas. And thank you again for joining our session. Please, please, please continue to uh, have the conversation on over into the community forum. And we'll be posting the, the recording there. And Thomas, I'll leave it on over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Uh, and thanks again to all of you taking the time.